name is Rebecca Dico, and I am a data scientist at the Smithsonian Institution within the Office of the Chief Information Officer um, and Research Computing. We have a data science lab, and I will share my slides. Okay. Please let me know if you can't see the slides at any point. Um, so today I'll be talking about some uh, work we're doing to enable the development of data set cards for data sets at the Smithsonian Institution. And as I get started, I'd like to first acknowledge the co-authors on this work, in particular Corey DiPietro at the National Museum of American History, and Mike Trisna, who many of you know also from our uh, office of the CIO at the Smithsonian. And this work that we're doing um, Kind of, to me, it comes out of kind of three major um, questions or things that are happening at the Smithsonian. The first was the launch of the Open Access Initiative, which happened in February 2020. And with that initiative, um, well, currently, as of a couple of months ago, there are four and a half million total open access media assets that are available. These are hosted on uh, Amazon Web Services, um, and they're freely available. Uh, with a CC0 license, so anyone can, can use them for any purpose. So that's kind of one impetus to, for us to kind of think about how we might document some of these data uh, better. The other is um, a small group of us uh, started meeting about a year and a half ago to, as, a, as a reading group around ethics of uh, AI and machine learning. And out from that has come this AI value statement that we're working on for the Smithsonian. So kind of a statement of our own AI values, even if we put our data out there at a, for a CC0 license that anyone can do whatever they want, we want to make sure that any internal projects reflect the institutional values. And then the third is kind of almost from a selfish perspective as a practitioner as we kind of encounter new data sets at the Smithsonian, it is just more and more evident how much domain specific knowledge is necessary in order to understand those data, um, why, what biases might be present in the data, um, and how there's just so much insider knowledge that's needed in order to use the data in the best way possible. And I, this is probably very obvious to all of you, but um, this is just something that we're really trying to get down you know, on paper and get this um, out to as many people as possible. Again, the Smithsonian has 21 museums, so there's also just a huge amount of expertise that takes many years to develop as someone who works here. And so as we, as the, the more we can kind of get people to contribute to these data set cards, we hope that they'll just become um, really, it'll make the, da the data much more usable by the community at large. So I'd like to talk today about two data sets that we're developing data set cards for. This, along with our AI value statement, will be coming out in a, a preprint in the next couple of weeks, I hope. So I will make sure to share that to the AI for Lamb channels as it's out. I was hoping it'd be out by now, but things always take longer than you think. Um, but one of the data sets I'd like to talk about is a Bumblebee mass digitization project. So this is this is a the 62,000, I think, bumblebees from the National Museum of Natural History have been digitized in collaboration with the Smithsonian Digitization Program Office. And here is how they look pinned in the tray, but they were all kind of individually removed and repinned. Um, and on the left, you'll see kind of the original um, image as it's been digitized. Um, and you'll see those two labels next to it. So those labels are normally pinned under the specimen and they were removed so that uh, they could be transcribed as well. So these were also transcribed by humans. Um, and I put on the right kind of the, as we're developing a species identification model, for example, or some other kind of computer vision model based on these images, um, we wanted to remove the background to make sure those labels are not kind of part of the uh, computer vision model. Um, and just to note also that this is kind of a separate data set already. So we could have this original data set of the original images with the labels, with the foam background, and we could also release a second version of this data set without the background. So that's kind of another use of the data set cards to kind of just you know um, separate these two data sets and document what we've done in each case. So now I'll just go through a couple of the 
um, from Hugging Face, uh, which is where, where we'll post these data set cards shortly, um, some of the uh, content that we've kind of come up with for some of the fields in those uh, data set cards. So the data set summary, this is kind of very simple, I guess, but really doesn't exist for Smithsonian data as we have it out there currently. So it says how many specimens we have, you know, what, what does the metadata, um, what is the metadata standard, which is this Darwin core standard, which is um, what GBIF uses, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. It mentions that, you know, 10,000 of these are not identified to species, which is kind of important to know as you kind of start using a data set. And the, the fact that many of these have been geo-referenced um, and that it's a worldwide data set, but you know, a lot of our data sets are worldwide, but they're really, they're not, uh, it's not unbiased in the sense that it's absolutely evenly distributed. So I think that's also an important thing to note is that collectors, you know, prefer, prefer to collect to different places or specialize in certain species. And so we will always have biased data. Again, as I just mentioned, the estimates of the geographic ranges may not be complete. And there are reasons why collectors collect from some areas uh, more frequently than others. Um, there's actually a paper about uh, botanical collections uh, showing that um, most plants in museums are collected very close to roads because those are easier to access. So whenever we're thinking about global data sets, we have to make sure that we're taking into account the fact that these are not truly um, you know, fully collected. Um, there's also, this is, there are no specimens from Australia and Africa in our US National Museum data set. And most specimens are expected to be female. So again, if you're not a biologist, you're coming to look at these, um, these bees. It's just really important to kind of include as much information as possible about the data. And then for other known limitations, um, things like the species identifications might not be accurate at all. And so this is something that we may, may use those labels as kind of ground truth, but taxonomy changes quite frequently. And so that may be something if you kind of grab this data set, you might have to kind of look for an up-to-date taxonomy and, and change, change the names. Um, collector names we know absolutely are not consistent across records. We've been working on a project to um, better attribute specimens to women because often women's names historically are recorded as Mrs. with the spouse's name. That's definitely true in our natural history data sets. So if you're looking to use the names in any way, you may have to think uh, about how you might uh, clean it up first. Um, for example, some other things, I don't want to read this whole thing, but specimens from Brazil, because of legal regulations, we're not allowed to include the images of those specimens online. Um, and for endangered species, we don't include locality data for so that people don't go find them and collect more of them. So again, these are just different ways that our data might not be complete or might not be accurate. And if you're wanting to use these data to build a model, you should know all of this right away. It shouldn't be something that you have to kind of call up a bunch of curators to find out. So the last data set I'd like to talk about is uh, very different. <laughs> so this is a photo of uh, Phyllis Diller, who some of you may know, some of you may not know, was a comedian, an American comedian. Um, active, I would say, from the 1960s to the 1990s or so when she passed away. And at the National Museum of American History, we have this card catalog, which is all of her jokes, which are written on index cards. And you can kind of see a photo of it. These have all been transcribed by through the Smithsonian Transcription Center. So volunteers signed up and transcribed these cards. Here you, you'll see an example on the top of how the actual card looks. So you'll see that stamp that says accident. Uh, most of the cards, if not all of them, are categorized into some kind of higher level topic that the joke is about. They'll have a date. Um, and so that's kind of the original card. And then we also have the transcriptions um, as, as well. So we have this data set that could be used for um, potentially refining OCR or for um, search if you want to kind of see if you can categorize to the same kind of topics that, that she categorized. And so in terms of the data set cards, some of the items we're pointing out is that, um, you know, exactly what these cards were, um, how they featured a category, um, and how they were transcribed. And there is, there is some potential privacy implications. So 
if uh, Phyllis Diller didn't write the jokes herself, she sometimes bought jokes from other people. And on those cards, uh, authors are listed normally with their first and last names, and sometimes their addresses are available. Um, there are celebrities and public figures represented in there. Um, and there also are identity categories, which we may no longer use today, or we, we may consider offensive today, um, but these have been um, released as is. And the social impact of the data set. So, you know, some of these jokes, if you read them today, some are still kind of funny and some may seem kind of offensive. They're very topical in the sense of there's a lot of jokes about Vietnam, a lot of jokes about feminism and women in the workplace. And um, they've been released verbatim, even though there may be, there are um, culturally sensitive jokes and offensive words or viewpoints. And so it's been kept everything how it is uh, currently, but we could imagine releasing a second version of the data set that might um, have some of those terms removed. And so that's kind of another reason for, um, I think that's my last slide, for um, developing these data set cards. So I know I kind of ran through that really fast, but um, that's some of what we're thinking about in terms of how we can document our data and make it easier for machine learning practitioners to use. And I, I welcome any questions you have. In the chat box. For yeah, the question was, how do data cards come into play when we build models out of the data? And I think, um, I think I gave kind of like an answer about how to use that manually, which is like maybe you'd want to only include, if you're developing a model to identify bumblebees, you only want it to maybe include in your training set those that are identified or those from a certain part of the world, depending on how broad you want to make your model. Um, and then the other example I gave is um, if we have multiple data sets where we've done an, a, a certain amount of processing on some version of it, uh, just documenting that processing so that um, you would know exactly what was done to it, because that's something that I've come across when trying to guess what's been done to a particular data set, particularly with text. Um, but I, I think maybe, okay, if that answers your question, I, I also kind of took it as being like, could we enable that to be done automatically somehow. And that's something that um, I think absolutely by having different data set versions um, that address some of these points that would get kind of more complicated and harder. But I think depending on how large the data set is, that would be something of use uh, depending on the um, what the different applications are for that data set. But I think it's a really good question because it, as of now, just pointing out that there there might be errors in a lot of the names is like helpful to some degree. But if it doesn't help you actually fix the errors, then you know, documenting is the first step. But we have a long way to go. I think that's that's maybe the answer. Yeah.